Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to First Unitarian. I'm Angela Herrera, the senior minister here, and it is so good to be together with you today. I'm here this morning with lay leader Lee Francis IV, with our tech arts director Chris Paul, our ushers Christine Robinson and Michaela Renz Whitmore, and drum roll please, also with our new ministerial intern, Matt Pargeter Virial. Look at the Zoom applause over there. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Matt graduated from Bright Divinity School in Fort Worth in 2019 with a special concentration in sexual and gender justice. And since the pandemic began, he has offered worship planning and been a virtual visiting preacher in 22 states across the country. Talk about making the most of it. Way to go, Matt. <laughs> Yeah, it has been um, a really interesting experience getting to travel, so to speak, across the country and getting to see different UU congregations. Um, I've, it's been a wild ride, but I'm very happy to be here in Albuquerque and honored and humbled to be part of the First Unitarian community. And I am very excited about the next few months and the work we get to do as a congregation together. Like I like to say, bring it on. Bring it on. <laughs> All right. That is the right spirit. <laughs> we look forward to getting to know you. And I want to let everybody know that next week there's going to be a special meet Matt breakout room. So come for that. You'll have a chance to chat with him in a smaller group. And everybody, please just join me in welcoming Matt and his husband, Gabe, also to Albuquerque and to First Unitarian Church. Aww. I also want to extend a special welcome to all of our other newcomers and visitors this morning. If you are visiting today for the first time and you feel comfortable, we invite you to put your name and location in the chat box so that we can offer a personal greeting to you today. Guazzi and good morning and welcome Matt. We have a couple of announcements this morning. First, we have a special guest preacher next Sunday. Bob and Angela have invited Christine Robinson back to the virtual pulpit to share some of her long perspective as our minister emerita. Christine says, here we are, masked again, worried, and perhaps sticking close to home. How is your resilience? Are you ready for the long haul? If not, let's talk about it. We get some help from my dog, Mosby, who had a trauma of his own to deal with this last year and sailed through. And next, why do really bad things happen to good people? How do you find your truth? How do you balance outrage and love? These are just a few of the excellent questions you sent to our ministers for last year's question box sermon. If you have a new one, or if yours didn't get answered before, Here's your chance. Two weeks from today, the question box returns. That means instead of preaching, Angela and Bob will draw your questions and take turns responding. So far, we have only received two questions and you're going easy on them. So put your questions in the chat box by typing Dear Ministers in front of it or email your questions to specials at uuabq.org. There is one more thing I'd like to share as well, and that is an ask for your help. First Unitarian is hiring for two positions right now for a bookkeeper and a director of operations. And I especially want to draw your attention to the director of operations, everybody. This is a really, really important role in our congregation. When operations, which are a big area, are running smoothly, it frees us up to do all kinds of creative and fun things as we express our mission in the world. So if you know somebody who is organized, friendly, and has experience in business management, send them our way. You can find the job posting on the church website. Both of those postings are on there. And I really hope you'll help us recruit some awesome people to work with a great team at a great organization. Thanks for your help with that. And now let's join together in lighting our chalices and candles. We seek our place in the world and the answers to our heart's deep questions. As we seek, may our hearts be open to unexpected answers. 
May the light of our chalice remind us that this is a community of warmth and wisdom and welcoming of multiple truth. The words of Julianne Lepp. Pause the chat for a few moments now as we prepare for meditation and prayer. While I was researching today's sermon topic of doubt, I came across this story about a conversation between Diogenes, who was one of the founders of Stoic philosophy, and Alexander the Great. The two men lived in the fourth century BCE. Here's the story. Diogenes asked Alexander what his plans were. Alexander answered that he planned to conquer and subjugate Greece. Then what? Diogenes asked. Alexander said that he planned to conquer and subjugate Asia Minor. And then? Alexander said that he planned to conquer and subjugate the world. Diogenes, who was not easily dissuaded from a line of inquiry, posed the question again. And what next? Alexander the Great told Diogenes that after he had finished conquering and subjugating, he planned to relax and enjoy himself. Diogenes responded, why not save yourself a lot of trouble by relaxing and enjoying yourself now? There are always so many other things we could be doing. But for this moment, let's save ourselves some trouble, won't we? And breathe. And be here now. And go ahead and give your weight over to the seat that's holding you. Or the floor. Or the bed. Be held. And let's continue together with two minutes of silent meditation.
It is said that a joy shared is doubled, while a sorrow shared is halved. When the music begins, you are invited to share your joys and concerns in the chat box as prompted by the video. If you aren't able to access the chat box, we'd still like to hear from you. You can email the care team at caring at uuabq.org. Please take the time to share your joys and concerns.
All of these we lift up. And from the pastoral prayer list, I lift up also the children of our congregation who returned to school this week and to yet another new normal and encountered news of yet another school shooting. May our children be safe, supported, and loved. And we hold all the loved ones of young Benny Hargrove, who was killed in our hearts as well. I lift up Louise Gersel, Nancy Cushman, and Jill Desjardins, all recovering from surgery. May their recovery be swift and complete. And I bless the memory of Larry McGoldrick, who died on Monday. A memorial service was held for him yesterday. We hold in our love all who knew and loved him, all who grieved that loss. Will you join me in prayer? I call us to attention before the spirit of life. I invoke the unutterable name of the most holy, which we sometimes call love. Love, we lift up our prayers to you this morning, ambitious prayers for a hurting world, especially for Afghanistan and Haiti. We pray for the people there, especially for the girls and the women under Taliban rule. We pray for all who are on the margins and for all who are suffering after the earthquake this week. We lift up prayers for the people here in this service right now, for all who are coping with grief or illness this morning or with injury of any kind. We lift up prayers for those struggling with addiction, for those living in recovery, for those facing change or financial stress, for any who are struggling with painful relationships or the need for forgiveness. We pray for courage to face each day and all that it brings with wise hearts. And we acknowledge the silent prayers among us, all the names and longings and gratitudes that remain unspoken. We give thanks for this day for the stars above us, the earth beneath, and for people all around the planet, praying in love's many names. For all these things, we give thanks and we say, Amen, and peace be with you. Thank you. 
Our reading this morning is called God Rid Me of God. It is by the Reverend Matt Laney, a minister for the United Church of Christ, or UCC. The UCC and UU denominations are both religiously liberal and share historical roots. The reading begins with this excerpt from scripture. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? Genesis chapter three, verse one. Occasionally, someone will come to me and sheepishly confess, I'm not sure I believe in God anymore. My response often comes as a surprise. You're not sure you believe in God anymore. That's great. Letting go of one view of God doesn't mean letting go of God. At least it doesn't have to. It might simply mean we are ready for a more expansive understanding of God. I'm not sure I believe in God anymore means we've outgrown one set of theological clothes and we are ready for another. Even serpents have to shed their skin every now and then. Meister Eckert, the 13th century Christian mystic, often prayed, God, rid me of God. That is, to rid him of limited ideas, images, and concepts about God, which constrained his understanding of divine reality. Theologically, Eckhart sought to outgrow wherever he happened to be. We are not meant to sit under a palm tree in paradise and not question, not struggle, not grow, not mature. Growth is the challenge of the Bible, which is why the Garden of Eden story, for me, is not a tale of paradise lost, but of paradise outgrown. This reading reminds me of how many of the world's major religions start out by warning people not to get too specific about the divine. In the Islamic holy text, the Quran, it is written that there is nothing like a likeness of God. And there's a Muslim belief that if people create specific images of God, it may lead to idolatry, to worshiping the image instead of the true divine. In Hinduism, there are countless deities to evoke uh, aspects of the divine, figures like Lakshmi and Kali and Vishnu and Ganesha, which might seem like a way of getting really specific, right? But actually the sheer number of them, as many as 33 million deities, suggests an ultimate beyondness, beyond those specifics. The Hebrew Bible also cautions against worshiping lifeless idols or graven images that distract people from the real God. And when Moses asks the real God's name, the God that is portrayed in the scriptures dodges the question or answers it head on by saying something to the effect of, my name is being. There's an ancient wisdom that it's better to keep God a little vague or a little uncontainable. And I've always found this fascinating. As you read them, the Hebrew scriptures start out by speaking of God in the plural, as in we gods. That's how God speaks in the creation stories. God says, let us create these things. And by the time you get to the Christian scriptures, there is a monotheistic theology. Only one God exists. And this monotheism, though, was considered by many other ancient peoples to be dangerously limiting, and it was even considered to be a form of idolatry because it was not expansive enough. So, interesting, right? In the lives of those early Christians, however, religion was more about ritual and custom and community than it was about intellectual claims. Religion was a way of life more than it was a set of truth claims. What happened is in the 17 and 1800s, there was this huge shift, a big cultural revolution in the West. 
the Western world. And this was the enlightenment when intellectual thought came to be valued above ritual and custom. Science was picking up speed in this era and metaphor and myth were seen as things of the past, relics of ancient times. Theologians and priests who absorbed the values of the culture around them also bought into the notion that the intellect was superior to other ways of knowing. And so it followed that religious knowledge became theoretical more than practical. As the religious historian Karen Armstrong notes, that is when we began to understand concepts like faith, revelation, myth, mystery, and dogma in a way that would have been, as she puts it, very surprising to our ancestors. In particular, she points out that people were now expected to accept a set of truth claims or beliefs if they wanted to be part of a certain church. And if anybody doubted those claims, if anybody felt uncertain about their absolute truth, well, pretty soon, doubt was equated with a rejection of faith and doubt became a sin. What a shift, right? From the ancient way of avoiding absolute claims about the divine to a belief that if you are even uncertain about those claims, then you are lacking in faith. From faith as a way of life to faith as a leap a person has to make over their doubt. Hence the phrase, leap of faith. And seeing the direction things had taken, seeing how humans had taken the Jesus story and become very rigid about what it meant, God created the side eye and Unitarian Universalism was born. Many UUs are come inners. That's what we say about folks who weren't raised UU because we don't really convert people, you know, we just say, hey, come on in. So come inners. So many of you use are commenters who were raised in another tradition, and a common theme in their stories is, uh, especially from the U.S., is being raised in a Christian tradition, experiencing doubt, and either losing or leaving their place in the faith because of it. I heard one story like that recently that was such a classic example. And I don't think the person would mind my sharing it, although I can't ask him because he died peacefully right before his 100th birthday this year. But he was raised in a very conservative Christian church, the kind with no dancing, no drinking, no card playing, nothing like that, very strict. And one day when he was in high school, he asked his pastor, whether his friends who belonged to other Christian churches would go to heaven. And the minister said that while they might, only their own church knew the true route to heaven. Well, this young man found that answer lacking. In other words, he had his doubts. And fast forward a few years, he was out dancing and drinking with a Unitarian girl. And then they got married and stayed married for nearly 70 years. And they attended this church that's how we get you. Doubt gets a bad rap. But, you know, just as the author of this morning's reading describes, it's actually really valuable in our spiritual lives. Doubt can lead us to test our beliefs against our values. Are they really in alignment? Doubt can lead us to leave behind what no longer serves us or no longer serves love and help us to grow in wisdom and practice. And of course, in this church, it really is okay if our doubts lead us to let go of or to just never take up the idea of God. About one third of this congregation identifies as atheist. But I also want to point out that while doubt might lead to disbelief, those two things are actually not the same. The word disbelief actually implies a kind of certainty, the certainty that something is not true. While doubt, on the other hand, is what we are less than certain about. In the year I spent as a chaplain intern at Brigham and Women's Hospital in the early 2000s, I saw a wide, wide range of spiritual beliefs. And in the ER and on regular floors, the way faith and doubt played out in a patient's or a family's experience varied so much. 
Sometimes a person was carried through heartache or through worry with their religious beliefs like a firm ground beneath them. You know, they took control of what they could. They handed the rest over to God, praying that they would just not feel alone in their suffering, but that they would be held in a larger love. And there was enough mystery around their understanding of God that their spirituality was resilient and strong. Other times, a patient or a family would cling to a certain religious belief long after it had become unhelpful or had been undermined by the situation, and it only seemed to cause more pain. And how many people did I see who were browbeating themselves, believing that if they'd only been more perfect, God would not have allowed a bad thing to happen to them? And a little bit of doubt about the way things work might have cracked open the door to grace, divine grace even, I would say, and might have eased their suffering. And sometimes I did encounter people who came in believing one way, embraced the doubts their experience stirred, and were therefore able to arrive at new understandings because they were open to it. What I walked away from that year knowing is that the idea of faith and doubt as opposites is just not correct. Although it sounds like a paradox, doubt is required for a strong faith. And it takes a lot of faith to embrace your doubts. Without the faith that allows us to risk embracing the mystery, doubt can be really paralyzing. And without doubt, faith is lacking in what is most essential for authenticity in the human spirit. And what are some of the doubts that might arise among faithful Unitarian Universalists? There are many actually, from disagreement about something a minister preaches to skepticism about something in the principles we affirm as a UU congregation, to troubling existential questions about life's meaning. Doubt is a part of the UU faith as well. The wonderful thing is that since this church is not based on a creed, your doubts are welcome here. About 10 years ago, when I was still a pretty new minister, somebody came to me for a pastoral visit and they asked me point blank, what is the meaning of life? They were experiencing some of those troubling existential questions. The religion they had been raised in had offered a firm answer, but they doubted that answer very much and they did not find it comforting. Did Unitarian Universalism have a better one? We had a conversation about shifting from needing to know the meaning of life to knowing how to live a meaningful life. And later I wrote a poem or maybe it's more of a meditation about the unanswered questions we carry. Some of you have heard it before. I'd like to share it again now since it's connected with this morning's theme. It's called Utterance of the timeless word. Utterance, speaking, the timeless word. So here it is. You bring yourself before the sacred, before the holy, before what is ultimate and bigger than your lone life, bigger than your worries, bigger than your money problems, bigger than the fight you had with your sister and your aches and pains, bigger even than your whole being, yourself who is part of and trapped within and blessed with a body that does what you want and doesn't do what you want and wants all the wrong things and wants all the right things. You stand at the edge of mystery, at the edge of the deep, with the light streaming at you, and you can't hide anything, not even from yourself, when you stand there like that. And then, what? Maybe you call your pastor and say, what is this? What am I looking at? What do I do? And your pastor comes and stands at the edge with you and looks over. She can't hide anything either, she thinks. 
not even the fact that she doesn't know the answer to your question. And she wonders if you can tell by looking at her that this is the case. She thinks of all the generations who've come there before you and cast words out toward the source of that light, wanting to name it. Somehow she thinks to herself, the names stayed tethered to the aging world and got old while the light remains timeless and burns without dimming. Meanwhile, the armful of worries you brought to the edge of mystery have fluttered to your feet. Unobscured by these, you shine back, light emanating unto light. You, with your broken heart and your seeking, you are the utterance of the timeless word. The name of the holy is pronounced through your being. Before I wrap up this morning, I do just wanna say a word about another kind of doubt that is impacting our lives right now. And that is doubt about the COVID-19 vaccine. Like many of you, I am sad that we are experiencing another wave of sickness and deaths. And I'm sad that this is complicating our reopening plans that we announced just a couple of days before the new wave began. I'm frustrated by how many people did not get the vaccine when it became available. And at the same time, it is important for us to be really clear in our thinking and in our words about misinformation and about doubt and about who is not vaccinated. You know, there are some people out there who are knowingly spreading misinformation, who are stoking fear, who are posing questions about vaccine safety that don't have any basis in fact, and they're doing this as a way of sowing division and drumming up anger, and that's not right. There are also some folks out there who refuse to practice any kind of precautions, including masking or distancing, and that is not right either. Ranking individual convenience over the lives of others is not right. The Bible doesn't teach it. It violates the golden rule. If we all lived that way, society would collapse. So let's be clear about that. And let's also be clear that there are still others who have doubts about the vaccine and who have not gotten it yet, but who do care and who do take other precautions. And a significant number of people of color who are not vaccinated fall into that group. And it's really important to acknowledge that difference makes a difference and to think about what perspective we're centering when we're looking out at the human landscape, right? This country's anti-blackness, to take a piece of this, this country's anti-blackness, starting with chattel slavery and morphing into Jim Crow laws, medical abuse, segregation, redlining, economic policy, drug policy, educational funding structures, prison industrial complex, and healthcare discrimination, right? Just like to name a few in that history, that has led to a situation where many black and brown people in this country found themselves in frontline jobs with little protection and higher rates of death when the pandemic hit. Who could blame a person in that situation if they felt suspicious when the same country that designed that reality then rushed in offering brand new vaccines to their community first, as happened in some cities. Who could blame a person for wondering whether that was an attempt to do right or another piece in a 400 year old pattern? Difference makes a difference. And not just for black Americans, but for lots of other folks too. I'm white. I had a different experience of my own. I had the experience of being 19 years old, pregnant, unmarried, poor, and in an interracial relationship in Oregon in the 1990s. 
And I want to share with you that my encounter with medical professionals in that time and place was pretty awful. It was so awful that I came to feel medical professionals could not be trusted. And when I encountered anti-vaccine literature after my baby's birth, I was already feeling like the last thing I wanted to do was go back to a doctor of any kind. And I found that literature easy to believe. While my kids were eventually fully vaccinated, I refused to follow the standard schedule. I got a lot of flack for that, but not the kind of meaningful conversation that would have reassured young me or would have addressed the harm I had experienced, which had sowed that doubt in my mind in the first place. Now, I was eager to get the COVID vaccine when it came out last winter, and I'm glad I did, and I'm gonna keep urging other people to do so too. I share these perspectives though, to encourage you, like to encourage all of us, not to be too quick to lump people together into vaxxers and anti-vaxxers, good and bad, but to look for the histories that are playing out right now and to speak from a place of deeper understanding and to seek that place of deeper understanding. Even as vaccine mandates become necessary from a public health perspective, I encourage us still to have faith in the value of compassion and non-judgment in our personal encounters. And most of all, I encourage all of us to be suspicious, not of one another in our communities, but of those who seek to pit us against each other. In a moment, we'll receive the offering. The Brain Injury Alliance of New Mexico is our change for the future recipient for the months of June, July, and August. The Brain Injury Alliance of New Mexico provides information, referral, support, and advocacy for people in New Mexico with brain injury. You can make an offering online by clicking on the link that we'll put in the chat box. And if you prefer not to give online, you can simply mail a check to the church and include change for the future on the memo line. Now, let us exercise together the enduring power of generosity. Oh, uh-huh.
What is generously given is received with gratitude. Thank you on behalf of the congregation and on behalf of the Brain Injury Alliance. So we're coming to the end of this formal hour of the service now. And of course, if you'd like to stay for a small group chat, you can do that. Just stay on through the post lewd and we'll create some breakout rooms. And whether for there or for other conversations in your day, you might like to have a conversation starter. So here's one. What role has doubt played in your spiritual path? And how is it active in your spirituality today, right now? What role has doubt played in your spiritual path? And how is it active in your spirituality today? And now, will you join me in extinguishing our candles and chalices? Go in peace, friends, and may love bless you and keep you today and always. Blessed be.